Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Bill DeVincenzi, and I am the Faculty in Residence for Sustainability, a new position uh, created by the Provost about six months ago. And um, I am basically having a wonderful time. Uh, and I'm not, you know, this isn't uh, sarcasm. This is uh, real. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, working with all these fine people that you're going to hear from today. Um, on the today's panel, um, and uh, as co-presenters, we have Ellen Metzger from the uh, Geology and Science Education uh, Department of College of Science, uh, Peggy Cabrera, uh, University Librarian, uh, Debbie Andres, who heads up the Office of Sustainability. And I have to say, Debbie would be one of the presenters, but uh, she's uh, lost her voice. And so um, I will be her voice today. So you'll be hearing a lot more of me than probably you would like. Uh, and Gina Marin, who's the, from the Center for Faculty Development. So welcome everybody. So first uh, we'd like to acknowledge uh, the land that we occupy. Um, we pause to acknowledge that San Jose State University sits on the land of the Ohlone and Muwekma Ohlone people who trace their ancestry through San Jose uh, we remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and play on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people past and present. So just to um, go through the normal workshop stuff, uh, please close any unneeded applications. We don't want to use any more bandwidth than we have to uh, mute, except when you're called on to speak. And uh, please use the chat to ask questions. Uh, we will reserve a little time at the end for more Q&A. Uh, this workshop should last about an hour and a half. And um, you know, with that, let's uh, press on. So um, this is the agenda. So this is kind of the general flow of how things are going to go. Uh, We'll talk about what sustainability is and why it's important for you to incorporate this into your course. Uh, we'll talk about how literal, how the level of sustainability literacy here at San Jose State, uh, how it's how we're measured, how we rank in terms of our sustainable actions, uh, our green facilities, our programs, etc. Um, we have three testimonials. The first one will be incorporating sustainability into a, a racial justice class. Um, and then uh, we've invited uh, Kathleen Wong, who is our director of DEI to talk about the importance of DEI uh, and why that also needs to be included in every one of our uh, sustainability courses. Uh, and then we'll have a breakout session where you can actually talk about this. So the breakout session will talk about um, you know, incorporating DEI and for you to brainstorm a little bit on how you might think about doing that. Uh, then we'll go over resources uh, from uh, the Office of Sustainability, from the library, from the Center of Faculty Development. There's a lot of resources available for you to make use of. Uh, there'll be a couple more testimonials. And then, um, and again, these are testimonials of professors who have actually added uh, sustainability into their courses. So these are kind of like examples, uh, you know, that you can take a look at and see what they've done. And then uh, we'll be presenting a little exercise on sustainable development goals uh, and uh, see how that comes out. It will be interesting to see your level of expertise in this. And then we'll wrap up and tell you how you can apply for your stipend. Okay, so Ellen, I'd like to introduce Ellen Metzger to go into what is sustainability. Thank you, Bill. And Thanks to everybody for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start our conversation today by, by just reflecting a few minutes on what is it we mean by sustainability? And of course, this is a very widely used word and there is no single definition, but probably the most widely cited way to define it is came from the 1987 United Nations Brundtland Report. You, you may have seen this one, uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And so 
this particular version of a sustainability definition has a, a built-in reference to intergenerational equity. And that's often a part of this concept. I wanted to uh, bring up the fact though that most of the challenges to sustainability uh, such as climate change and habitat loss and so on arise here at this intersection between complexly interacting human and natural systems. And so if we look at that, we look at the fact that this is inherently disciplinary, interdisciplinary to look at sustainability. And that's why I'm happy to see faculty from across the university uh, tackling challenges to sustainability is going to have to be an all decks on hand endeavor. There isn't going to be any single discipline that's capable uh, of solving these issues. And so just as a quick example, we can certainly look at climate change from the perspective of science. And we need to understand the fundamental science that underlies why climate change is happening and how the Earth system acts. But at the same time, we need to be mindful of the social systems, of the behaviors and the values and the legislation that drives unsustainable ways of living. And if we don't consider both of these, if we don't look at science and social science and humanities and engineering, then we aren't going to have a holistic view of what sustainability is. So some other ways to frame sustainability, next slide please, is in terms of the three so-called pillars of sustainability. And again, this reflects on that interdisciplinary nature where we look at the social, environmental and economic dimensions of sustainability. And sometimes this is framed in terms of the three E's, environment, economy, and equity. In any case, it's meant again to look at this interacting pieces that must be looked at holistically in order to understand sustainability. And next. All right, so this brings us to the sustainable development goals or SDGs for short. And uh, this was part of the this was issued and adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015 as part of the uh, agenda 2030 as, as a plan for uh, achieving a more sustainable future by the year 2030. And this is sometimes called the blueprint, a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. In fact, a uh, commonly associated phrase is leave no one behind. And so I know it probably is difficult to make out any detail on the diagram, but there are 17 of these sustainability, sustainable development goals, and they range from no poverty to gender equity to responsible consumption to climate action and, and are all interrelated with one another. Now, relating this to education and to considering how we might integrate sustainability concepts into our classes, you can see that education is one of the, has a sustainable development goal of its own, SDG for quality education, but if you stop and think about finding a more sustainable path forward is going to require some fundamental changes in, in our worldviews and, and how we think and act, a profound change in the way we think and act. And that's only ever going to happen through transformative learning. And so education is considered key to the SDGs and, and the fact that it can be a catalyst for uh, achieving all 17 of them. And these SDGs can help to motivate students who want to make a difference in the world. 
and to help them link their learning to something larger than themselves, to these larger goals, these collective aspirations to find a more sustainable future. So I, I will stop there and just hope that might get some thinking going about what do we mean by sustainability and turn it back to you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Ellen. And, um, you know, sustainability and the SDGs go hand in hand. And we'll talk about those uh, more a little later. Uh, I'd like to go through a little bit about, you know, what is the sustainability literacy of our students? Um, and, um, you know, one of the, our goals and objectives is to ensure that our graduates are sustainably literate uh, and that they can engage in actions that will enhance sustainability once they leave our university. Um, in looking at, um, you know, we don't look so bad about students who have graduated because, you know, about 60% of them uh, have at least one sustainability learning outcome, either in a course or a course in sustainability. So that's a good number, but uh, the, the goal, the objective is 100%. And that's why we're doing this, uh, this course uh, is to hopefully uh, continue to add to these numbers. Quite frankly, when we poll students who are first coming in, um, their sustainability literacy uh, is, is pretty poor and probably remains that way through most of their career here until they run into one of these courses. Um, I'm working with uh, a group of students from the uh, Sabona Honors Program in the Management Department to try to uh, find out how students hear and listen and learn about things outside of class and see if we can't um, you know, prime the pump here and improve sustainability literacy amongst the students uh, you know, uh, before they get into one of these classes and hopefully encourage them to get into one of these classes. Um, on the academic side, um, we do, uh, uh, when we try to identify which courses include sustainability, we do use the 17 uh, sustainability development goals that Ellen was just talking about and look at the course catalog and see if we can find you know, a key indicator that says, yeah, they're talking about this particular topic. Um, we've actually, and this is Debbie going through, you know, multiple iterations of this course catalog, uh, identifying 1500 courses, or roughly 32% of our courses that actually talk about uh, one or more of these 17 uh, sustainable development goals. And that's pretty impressive, uh, you, know, you know, judging from what I've seen from other universities. Uh, obviously, we'd love to see that number go up. Uh, but 67 out of the 73 academic departments offer sustainability related or focused. Focus meaning it's a course on sustainability related means it has an element of sustainability in it. Anyway, uh, if one of your courses uh, has uh, that, you have this cool little leaf uh, notification. And if it doesn't, let's make sure that all of your courses do. Um, <clears throat> as far as research is concerned, uh, roughly, uh, 13% or 75 uh, faculty are currently conducting research. Uh, uh, this number is relatively low, but not terribly low relative to other universities. Uh, we're currently trying to raise more money uh, and uh, we have some grants actually in line right now that'll help maybe perhaps uh, in, increase this number. Um, but that, interesting enough, spreads over 47% of the departments. So uh, there, it, it's becoming more and more widespread. Uh, we have sustainability-focused uh, research centers uh, in the Mineta Transportation Institute, uh, in the Center for the Development of Recycling, and of course, uh, our Moss Landing uh, Marine Lab. If you'd never visited that, by the way, it's a pretty impressive site. I've been down there uh, and it's been, it's, it was awesome. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how we're measured, um, this is um, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, which is a mouthful. Uh, so we call it ASHI. And ASHI has uh, the STARS uh, reporting system, sustainability tracking, assessment, and rating. Uh, and um, this covers uh, all universities around the world uh, submit information into this organization. And, uh, and then they take a look at what you submit and you can see that the submissions cover, you know, everything, academics, uh, our engagement, our operations, our planning, our innovation, uh, all of the departments are consulted. Uh, Debbie does this work and it, it, it is a yeoman's amount of work. And uh, the last time we reported, you do this every three years. And the last time we did it in 2020, 
we achieved a, a STARS goal. Now we had done this, uh, I think the prior time, 2017 as well, but we are firmly entrenched in the gold uh, certification level. So AISHI has uh, four levels, uh, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. Uh, there are only 14 universities in the world that are platinum. Uh, we are you know, not close to that, but we are striving to improve our gold ranking and want to continue to improve on it. Um, we are one of six CSUs of certified gold, and that's good also because um, a lot of the CSUs are certified either bronze, silver, or gold. And so, uh, you know, California, you know, kind of leads the way in terms of these certifications. But the biggest number is this bottom one. And when you look at where we rank overall amongst all universities, we're in the top 6%. And that is absolutely amazing and outstanding uh, uh, performance. So there are a number of different rankings. Sierra Club uh, ranked us uh, 20, 50th out of, I don't know how many hundreds, uh, which is great. And I'm sure that ranking is going to improve when they see our 2020 results. Um, Princeton Review, uh, they don't really rank you. They just say, hey, you're one of the 416 most environmentally friendly colleges. Well, fine. Nice to be listed. But the important one is the one we were just talking about, uh, the uh, AC ratings, which, uh, again, out of 1,035 universities that actually tried to get a rating, only about 600 and something actually got a rating at all. And uh, we were actually literally number 60 out of that 1,035, which puts us, like I say, well into the top 6%. So great job, uh, Debbie, and all who uh, helped us achieve that. Um, as far as green facilities are concerned, um, we uh, have achieved... Uh, now, this is kind of impressive because uh, our greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, have decreased uh, over the last 30 years, and our energy output and consumption, I should say, has been increasing. So to decrease your, um, your emissions while you're increasing your, your usage of, of these kinds of uh, materials, uh, I think is pretty impressive. Um, we have solar panel installations in South Campus now, which makes that whole area basically uh, energy neutral because it, it, it provides enough uh, power to power that whole South Campus uh, complex. Uh, we have 134 EG EV charging stations uh, in South Campus right now, uh, either there or under construction. And we have 40 uh, EV stations in a 10th Street garage. So uh, we are expanding, uh, you know, this uh, um, amenity, if you will, to encourage more and more students to drive electric. Most of our new buildings and major renovations since the MLK library uh, have been built to achieve LEED Gold certification. Uh, this basically means that your facility is um, meets certain stringent requirements for energy uh, and usage and efficiencies. And uh, we're proud to say that our aquatics, our new aquatic center is, is LEED Gold certified. Uh, the new science building under construction will be, uh, and all new buildings uh, will be uh, LEED Gold certified. So that's another uh, nice achievement. Um, we've been using recycled water at the university for a long time. Uh, and uh, there'll be a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, you know, basically uh, we save uh, 90 million gallons of, po of potable water uh, a year uh, by using recycled water. So this is a good thing. And the university got in very early on this. Um, the CSU has a, a plastics ban on single use plastics, which uh, needs to be achieved by 2023. Uh, we are working to make sure that we are compliant with that. So uh, we are doing, I think an excellent job in the area of facilities. Uh, these are the 10 uh, faculty who sat in your seats uh, last semester in the spring uh, and who received uh, stipends to install or insert sustainability into their courses. Uh, you're going to be hearing from uh, Sung Jay, uh, Bill Musgrave and Edith Kinney today on what they did. Those will be the three who will be presenting uh, to us uh, in, a, in a little while on what they've, uh, how they've incorporated sustainability into their courses. Um, so the objective here is, uh, as you can see, increasing the number of courses and departments that include sustainability, um, 
incorporating diversity, equity, inclusivity into our courses as well. You can't really talk about sustainability without also talking about DEI because the two have to be uh, inter inter integrated as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and uh, we'll have a fun little exercise later on about that. And um, remember that uh, there will be $500 awarded to 10 of you who uh, apply uh, to uh, uh, and provide your sustainability uh, in development plans to us. So I'll talk about that, how you do that later. Okay, Ellen, uh, up to you to introduce Edith Kinney. Yes, thank you, Bill. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce Edith Kenny, Associate Professor in the Department of Justice Studies. And um, Edith, I Bill, Bill, can you give uh, Edith permission to share her screen? She's going to show her slides directly. Yeah, I think Debbie, Debbie, you need to do that. Because oh, thank you, Debbie. All right. I think I got it. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm back to being here. <laughs> well, I am. I am just so very excited. Um, hold on, let me focus for one second. View, present. There we go. Um, to be with you today, uh, be here with you today, because uh, this module has been, you know, very close to my heart. Um, actually, we've been um, working on um, sustainability issues without saying so much, right? Um, and it's good to be part of a university where this is built into our physical infrastructure, our planning, and um, our diversity and inclusion goals. Because I think many of the issues that our students are facing um, really are sustainability issues. And um, as part of the Human Rights Institute, I've worked on a variety of projects on um, kind of basic needs and knowledge of our local resources and local systems. And I think that's where we can really um, both improve our students' um, uh, literacy in terms of sustainability, but also get them jobs working with many of the agencies and um, organizations that are um, using sustainability as a framework to advance social justice and human rights. Um, so I just briefly want to let y'all know um, that this, this was a new um, kind of effort for me, um, sparked in part by the response to um, the Dakota Access um, Pipeline protest, the Standing Rock. Um, so I'm from Minnesota originally. If you can tell, if you can hear my voice, if I say bagel or about or quote, usually you can hear <laughs> the Minnesota in the in my voice. Um, and and so I I grew up fishing and um, picking berries and. Um, swimming in lakes and um, gathering, har harvesting wild rice um, from our, our lakes and our, our, our waterways. And so um, hearing that um, even after Standing Rock and even after the Keystone Pipeline um, project was shut down, um, this pipeline project has gone through. Um, and so I have, I've used this um, uh, topic, right? I was drawn to sustainability in part because of my research on human trafficking and development and how development projects and um, energy projects in particular can kind of run roughshod on rural and indigenous communities. And so um, time together my personal interest in um, conservation and um, our beautiful northern Minnesota pristine wilderness with <laughs> hundreds of thousands of lakes um, and this tar sands pipeline that's going to be that was going to be put right through um, many of the northern um, indigenous um, tribal and ancestral lands. Um, so I have adopted this um, kind of intersectional environmentalism approach. So I was really happy to see Aliyah Thompson come to our campus and, um, and um, I think students are really uh, into this, uh, a, a positive kind of framework to, to take action because I, I, I sense among our students um, uh, almost, a, um, well, I sense frustration and fear, right? Because of the future that they're facing and the um, lack of coordinated action uh, on on their elders' part to get uh, to get our 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 to get our houses in order, shall we speak? Um, so I, I've I've taken this uh, sustainability module in two ways. Um, the first does a, a climate change 
um, uh, analysis that focuses on sustainable development goals relating to um, access to justice, access to um, legal representation, um, indigenous rights, and um, the particular vulnerabilities of um, indigenous and island nations that are on the front line of the climate um, crisis in terms of refugees or forced migration as a result of um, uh, economic and development activity that they have not benefited from. Um, so this helps us bridge some of the kind of global and local questions while looking at um, a kind of a policy in a, in a comparative uh, context. And then the, the unit that we're actually working on right now explores um, the resistance and environmental justice movement and how different groups um, are calling attention to the intersecting ways in which race, um, indigeneity, um, uh, social location, a uh, class um, can intersect to um, compound the harms that um, environmental harms that our communities are, are suffering, right? So um, if you're keeping up with the news, the Michigan has told another entire town not to bathe in their water, drink their water. I, I have a two-year-old and so and apologies if you hear him in the background, um, but if you don't have water, I don't know what you're going to do with a two-year-old. You can't drink your own water, right? And this issue um, really is highlighted by the intense um, kind of criminalization and this collaboration between the state um, uh, as well as corporations, right, in terms of pipeline protests. So um, in Minnesota, we, we, we've gotten um, the next kind of phase of uh, pipeline protests after um, the very kind of uh, global support for um, Standing Rock um, <clears throat> And then the successful kind of uh, stoppage of, of one pipeline project. Um, but here we can see the increasing role of um, uh, corporations, right? Expect particularly extractive industries in working with state legislators to create laws that criminalize protest, right? So this unit is really helpful because it illustrates, it's, it's, it's actually really, really helpful from a pedagogical standpoint because I have it right in the midterm section, right? So they're thinking about um, these core ideas about human rights, that we should all have the right to life and liberty and security, right? And we look at how environmental harms, um, both past um, um, environmental projects, like the, the planning of where we site our roads and um, our housing zoning kind of laws, and how um, people who have been left out of, uh, of rights respecting traditions have um, borne the brunt of the damage that um, our, our unsustainable practices have caused. Um, so I really am excited to incorporate this. I think it's wonderful to have a framework that students can practice applying things, um, uh, applying the ideas that they're learning about mm -hmm. to actual public policy problems. Um, so one of the things that I've been incorporating in my class is a proposal for a, a sustainability project at SJSU, incentivizing them thinking about what they're learning in class and the human rights implications of sustainability issues. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be working on their own proposals to submit to the sustainability office so we can get a little um, projects going here and hopefully um, let students really understand that um, while these are global problems, uh, uh, these uh, we can and must take action at the local level. Um, and so I've been really excited at the responsiveness and students are, are, are eager, I think, to um, take on assignments that are framed as this is a this is the kind of work project that you would do if you were working in one of our county agencies trying to develop a program, right? So I think that this, um, this has been a great opportunity to kind of rethink some of my own um, material, but also I think really gives us a way to work across disciplines. Um, and so I invite folks that are interested in this work, um, indigenous rights, as well as um, kind of proactive uh, human rights defense. Uh, you can uh, join us at the Human Rights Institute and um, my email I'll put it in the chat right now, but I, I really thank the uh, Office of Sustainability and um, encourage folks to think about this as a, a DEI issue as well, because it so profoundly illustrates the inequities of our current unsustainable practices. Any questions? Yeah, I think we'll hold questions to the end. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> that just makes me so happy. <laughs> Thank you. And
And, and, and the timing is perfect uh, because uh, I would now like to introduce um, Dr. Kathleen Wong. Uh, she is San Jose State's Chief Diversity Officer. She serves on the President's Cabinet. Um, she comes from uh, the University of Oklahoma. I don't notice any any accent there, uh, Kathleen. So uh, <laughs> I spent two years there. I was running. I was running uh, NCOR, the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Ed, out of University of Oklahoma. Right. But I, I'm, I'm a California native. So. Yeah. Yeah. So so that was part of that. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to say that again. Uh, but she was <laughs> named in 2015 by Diverse Issues in Higher Education as one of women's. History Month's top 25 women in higher education. Uh, she is a first generation college student and of interest, uh, she has four rescue dogs. So Kathleen, you're on. Thank you so much, Bill. And I've really appreciated the presentation so far. Um, it's, it's been really wonderful. Um, I'll be sharing my screen just a little bit, but um, wanted to just, just do a little opening. Um, you know, and I think it, it's just, you know, really want to recognize the work that um, um, Ellen has done, certainly the work, um, you know, that many people have done uh, long term, as well as the, the new folks who are, who are entering into this work. And so hopefully my talk will give you some food for thought. So sustainability is the art of living well together without diminishing the opportunity to live well in the future. And this is something that Ellen Metzger, of course, has worked on and shared in her publications and, and research and writing. Um, while recognizing that sustainability work has drawn largely from the sciences and social sciences, scholars such as our very own Ellen Metzger and others have expanded discussions into the realm of philosophy, framing the ethics of what it means to build sustainability into our systems and processes, environmentally, socially, and economically over time. So I'm not here today to school any of you in this room of experts on sustainability about sustainability itself, but I'm here to provide some intellectual and pedagogical entry points to integrate what we call DEIJB or diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging into the work um, of sustainability. And so I'm going to um, quickly share my slides. Hopefully I can do this. Oh, wait. I did something weird where I left a, there we go, a window halfway between screens, which is not going to work. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Can you all see my screen yet? Can y'all see it? Okay. All right. Um, so um, I I won't be going over the um, the land acknowledgement because that was done. We do have a longer one. I encourage you to go to our website. I'm going to blow through some stuff really quickly. So because of the time limitations, but I wanted for you to understand a little bit about our campus as you're um, as you're developing your courses. Many of you probably already know this information. Um, so you, when you look across the racial and ethnic makeup uh, from administration to faculty to staff to students, you'll notice some patterns, right? So what we'll see is as the, the higher the, the rank as you go in terms of these different classifications on campus, you'll see that the population becomes more white um, and people of color, uh, particularly underrepresented people of color, um, the numbers are, there's a mismatch between all of us who are employees and our students, right? Um, and that's something, of course, that you've heard about. Just to briefly share, there's a lot of research that shows that um, having somebody who who not just looks like you, but you identify with in terms of life experiences is incredibly important in raising academic identity um, for students. So many students have a tentative academic identity. They feel like I'm here only in, in as so far as I can perform and, and do the things I'm supposed to do. Um, but that academic identity is very tentative. When students see someone who is like them, um, in the ranks, then what they do, they, it makes their academic identity less fleeting and less tentative. And so that's really important. There's a halo effect as well. So if there's other students, you know, so if your schedule doesn't allow you to take that one class from someone that you identify with, just knowing your department has that person is really incredibly important, again, in sustaining academic identity, which we know are some of, is one of the really important um, factors for um, student success and, and resist resilience and sticking through. Um, this is just another representation of the data. It's pretty stark when you look at, um, you know, from side to side and front to back, the differences um, between who our students are and who we are. 
some of the lesser known characteristics that you might not know about, uh, some of you may already know, 37% of our campus in terms of undergraduates are Pell qualified, um, which means that they are low income and they qualify for Pell grants. We have 41% uh, of our students are first generation. And so when you look at, for example, our Asian American students on campus, um, what we have is a very different makeup than what you would find in the UCs or like than like at Santa Clara County, right? A lot of our students are first generation working class um, students, many are Southeast Asian from Vietnam, Cambodia, other places, and a large number of Philippinex students. And their students' success numbers are between um, Black and Latinx students, and they, they're rendered invisible with the URM grad um, uh, uh, plan for CSU, which does not take into account Southeast Asian and Philippinex, doesn't break them down. So what happens is the Chinese and Indian and Korean uh, and Japanese group Japanese American groups brings up that entire category and renders this group invisible. We have mixed immigration status families, and we have, um, you know, so when we're talking about undocumented uh, families, sometimes we have undocumented students, sometimes the student themselves is not undocumented, but maybe they have members of their family that are. And this creates, of course, a lot of stress, a lot of economic issues, as well as, in, um, you know, possible, um, you know, not utilization of policing and a lot of public services for fear. Um, of being deported. There's intergenerational trauma from refugee migration experience, and this is really common in the Southeast Asian uh, community. There's, of course, intergenerational trauma among indigenous peoples. There is, you know, of course, among um, Black families and communities and many other communities. And a lot of times what we don't understand is that this intergenerational trauma produces a lot of um, issues of uh, mental health issues, substance abuse, um, other types of issues. And a lot of times those are invisible. So we see students showing up, you know, they're, everyone's pressured to show up and appear a certain way, speak a certain way, dress a certain way, so that we all approximate sort of like these middle class sort of uh, ways that we show up in class. And so a lot of times, a lot of this is really invisible. Um, and so you may not know, for example, that many Southeast Asian families on, on our campus have at least one family member that is has been incarcerated for at least 10 years, right, in terms of in the prison system for various crimes, um, some of them involving, um, you know, su substance abuse, drug distribution, some involving gang violence, other types of things. And so it's very easy to stereotype about why those things may occur. But when we look at the intergenerational trauma of um, Southeast Asian peoples migrating from um, uh, uh, refugee camps in Asia for many years and then finally coming to the United States, we can understand in terms of the um, the trauma, the, the violence that has occurred and, and genocide that has occurred for some of these um, families and peoples. So I just want to share that as sort of a, um, um, a start and beginning for you to understand who's on our campus um, and that often some of these things, these issues are invisible. There's a lot more issues that I don't have time to talk about, but I just wanted to, to start with those. Okay. So historically, um, you know, the entry point, I'm going to um, stop sharing just for a second here. Let's see. It's so hard on Zoom to find everything on my screen. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing there. All right. Um, so historically, the entry point, I, I think, well illustrated um, by um, Edith Kinney's work. The entry point for looking at um, DEI, JB, and sustainability has been analyzing environmental racism and the disparate impacts on marginalized communities from corporate and municipal, you know, environmental dumping and storage of waste, uh, waste materials. There's certainly air quality, uh, air water quality management or lack of management um, and enforcement. There's flood control management issues, wildfire management. I mean, there's a the number of topics, of course, are, are huge. And there is incredible work being done in terms of including case studies that reflect the scope of communities impacted, as well as an analysis of the systemic and structural policies and practices and shortfalls of resource distribution, political influence, and enforcement of environmental standards. But what I want to share with you today is a meta-level discussion about the theoretical frameworks and criteria that can be used to integrate DEIJB into your work as teachers, researchers, and members in the area of sustainability so that sorry, mentors in the area of sustainability, so that your entry point for the work is not just through case studies, but also through some very basic understandings of sustainability and what it means to live well from different perspectives. So I'm gonna start by sharing a story um, of my son who's 19 years old and is one of the leaders and organizers of a local chapter of the Sunrise Movement, a national youth-led organization addressing climate change. My partner, partner and I granted him permission to participate in the Line 3 protests up in Northern Minnesota, traveling with a contingent of climate change activists from the Bay Area earlier this summer. 
Um, this was one of the hardest decisions we ever made because <laughs> he's only 19 and COVID and everything else. But they had fundraised, had developed COVID-19 safety protocols, and like good activists, talked about steps and phone trees if one was arrested and detained. Um, and even other things like Discord servers and other things because we knew there would be very little cell service up in northern Minnesota. He spent three days doing manual labor work, hauling supplies, helping, supporting, and protecting indigenous water protectors, and training others who were coming from all over the U.S. and North America to assist the water protectors in this uh, three-day um, event, um, activism event, up for to, um, to protest Line 3 and shut it down, literally. Um, when I picked him up at the airport afterwards, there was almost no cell service where the Line 3 waterhead was located, so he couldn't, you know, he couldn't, we couldn't hear from him. He could not stop talking. He had tears in his eyes. He shared that there was a river ceremony at the beginning held by the water protectors in which protesters were invited to take a flower, to place in the headwaters of the river, to send blessings, and to remind them and to connect with the power of the life, of life in the river and the water and to connect that to those who had been lost during the pandemic, to the missing and murdered people from indigenous nations and from everyone's families. The native woman shared that it was important to heal ourselves as well as heal the earth. I wanna share that I lost my younger brother to COVID-19 last year, an earth shattering loss in my family. My son silently placed a flower in the river and as he watched the flower float down, he told me he felt connected to the wider world in a deep and a profound way that he had never experienced. He said it changed the tenor of his work and how he saw his work at Sunrise, and it changed how he saw himself in the world. I share this with you because I think it is illustrative of the wisdom and worldviews that are often invisible to us in our work. Our fundamental ways in which we teach, the purpose of education, how we instructure our inter interactions, and organize our curriculum have profound impact on our students and on the lives they will lead, whether they have professional or casual activist positions in sustainability work. My son said he had heard that water is life, water is sacred, people are sacred, but now he really understood what it meant. And this led him to rethink how their work in Sunrise was very much mostly continual discussions about efficiency, cost benefit analysis of political actions and for Sunrise action events at the national level. He learned from the water protectors from the ways in which they welcomed allies, shared their histories and told stories of the sacredness of water and the sacredness of caring for each other in the earth and its life and its water was important for him and for his colleagues to learn. And so this story brings to light um, some of the ways in which we can have alternative frameworks to understand our place in the world and our connectedness in the world. And so I'm going to share with you, um, so I'm going to go back to sharing my other screen. So hang on for a second. Okay. Um, so what's important to know is um, you know, a lot of times we, when we think um, about our own education and how we think about how we're connected to the world, that it's it's very much bound in in different values that we that we think of, that are pretty invisible to us. So most of you know Maslow's hierarchy. Um, you've seen this before, right? So at the bottom are our basic needs in terms of shelter, clothing, food, safety, and the and the understanding is that if you don't take care of these things at the bottom, then it's very hard to move on to the more important things like relationships and self esteem. And then of course the pinnacle is self actualization. And what you may not know is that Maslow actually um, you know, some people, some indigenous people say stole, but um, borrowed um, from uh, Blackfoot um, hierarchy of um, needs. And that uh, one of the one of these scholars, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who's from uh, Canada and one of the first peoples up there, uh, tribes up there, up in Canada, she shares that actually um, he he learned about the Blackfoot um, hierarchy of these, which was based on the shape of a, a teepee and other types of um, triangles in Native American culture, and that self-actualization is at the bottom um, and community actualization is next and then cultural perpetuity is really um, the goal. Right. And so it's a very different type of hierarchy in which you are inherently connected um, to your community, that the purpose of self actualization is actually for community development. This is a very different worldview. And so what I what, the reason why I'm sharing it is to challenge you to think about how deeply embedded some of our understandings of individualism, collectivism, um, interdependence and independence are invisible to us, but very visible to our students. So students will often say, I don't understand why, you know, why is it that I'm, you know, uh, you know, why can't I bring my 
my parent or my friend over to an advising session, for example, to um, to talk about my classes and talk about my grades and why do I have to sign all these papers, right? So a lot of the ways in which we set up things, we don't set them up in a collectivistic view when our students have really learned that what's important when they're choosing their major, for example, it's important what their family thinks of it. It's not just their own decision, right? And so when you're thinking about sustainability and the courses that you're developing, the degrees that you're wanting to, you know, the minors or the certificates you're wanting to produce, it's really important to think of collectivism and not just the individual student um, as the agent and the decision maker, um, that people are connected, right? And that more likely a lot of your students who are wanting to take these classes are thinking at the community level. Um, here are some, um, you know, and I'm going through quickly again because of time, but um, I'll give you a copy of these slides afterwards. But when we look at individualism and collectivism, it's really the unit at which you see the self, right? And how you understand um, what what belongs to you and what belongs to everybody else and the impact of your actions um, on everybody else. And so for me, the work of sustainability is just so ripe for a lot of the cultural worldviews that our students come from that you're, you're engaging this because you do care about the world, because you do care about your connection to the community, because you do care about the fate of an entire collective and not necessarily just me and myself and my nuclear family. Um, another model I wanna share with you, so that so the, the hierarchies, um, you know, the Blackfoot hierarchies uh, of needs and then individualism, collectivism and um, interdependence and independence is a way of looking at how people think about themselves in relationship to others as the unit that's most important is the collective versus the singular self unit. Here's another model, um, model that um, you, some of you may be familiar with, particularly if you come from ethnic studies or if you come from sociology or education. And that's Yasso's um, very influential model that she uh, came to, she published in 2005 um, called the Community Cultural Wealth Model. It has been adapted and used for deaf communities, adapted and used for immigrant communities, for all types of communities to look at because it's highly effective, I think, in helping teachers in particular, but those who are in education understand what their students bring um, to the classroom. So it's the opposite of what we call the deficit model. So we often think that our students, you know, come with a deficit of capital when they come into cultural capital, when they come into our institutions. And in fact, they come with the richness of it. So you'll see in this model that there are, um, it's, it's like a pinwheel, right? They all contribute to community cultural wealth. And so you can see familial, social, aspirational, resistant, uh, resistance, navigational, linguistic. I'll cover uh, the, the ones that are easiest to understand probably, um, well, fast. First, so linguistic capital, obviously, um, you know, it means that you are you are multilingual, you can read or speak or relate to people different communities based on language, but it also gives you a worldview from your language, as you know, you may know that language shapes reality and the ways in which you view relationship respect all these a lot of these, these very um, affective um, uh, concepts as well as intellectual concepts. They also bring navigational capital. And what that means is people often come from under-resourced communities. And so people have developed very resilient ways to make something out of nothing, to innovate, to um, to borrow, to, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy something, right? So when we talk about, you know, using, not using the things that are already store bought and already, um, already made because of the lack of economy to produce that creates innovation. And so there's navigational capital. And it's not just an individual navigational capital, it's a community based one, right? So it's with your family, it's with your friends, your neighbors, there's resistant capital. And what that means is people have directly dealt with resistance, activism, um, you know, filing complaints, doing things, and that sort of resistance capital is really important because then people have an understanding of systems, they have an understanding of structures that many families who've had a lot of privilege may not, may not have had to navigate in the same way. There's aspirational capital, which means that, you know, um, families are supporting that, they're hoping that their student, of course, will will get their degree and leave with um, you know a degree of um, uh, economic security um, they may not understand that their students may change culturally um, having you know spent four or five years six years at an institution like San Jose State and so that aspirational capital is really important social capital and familial capital um, are ones where um, students ha come from with an assumption that they draw upon people who are it, who are supporting them and those people may not be just people in their extended family it could be people who are neighbors people who are community 
leaders, um, people who are in their churches, in their community um, centers and those type of things. And so students come with an idea that they can draw on all these things. They come to San Jose, a place like San Jose State and suddenly they feel like I can't draw on those things because those things are not valued here. So I challenge you to think about when you're developing your your course projects, when you're developing, um, you know, when you're asking students, what do they know about sustainability, show them this Yasso model and really try to work through some of those because people are doing have been doing sustainable things um, for a long time. We all know this um, from, you know, even uh, middle class white families, right, um, working class families in terms of sustainability. People have done things that we call upcycling and all this other stuff. We have fancy words now, but they have been done for a long time. So it's a way to let students know that they have cultural knowledge and they have actually valuable knowledge. Um, that's an important part of their education. And I challenge you to to, to really um, look up some of some of this work um, that I've presented to you um, to bring it to your own work as you're developing um, for yourself. Um, so I want to I want to close by um, letting you know that that what's important about um, the DEI uh, DEI JB is that you're understanding that it's not just an add on including a case study. Right. And, and so when you only just include a case study that's diverse, for example, this is the word that people use, you include a case study that's diverse. What happens is students sort of know that somehow it's it's kind of like a, a square peg in a round hole. Right. It 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 feels like it is inclusive of in communities, but the tools that I'm given to look at it and analyze it and see what I bring to the table don't feel like they actually uh, are reflective of my own background and my own experience and my own knowledge base. And so by looking at these models, you give your students agency to, you know, in terms of epistemology and ontology, they have agency to create knowledge, right? They, they, can, they can interpret and process what you're teaching them, and then they are owners of that learned knowledge, and therefore more likely to apply that learned knowledge later on because they have agency in knowledge production. And so I hope that this was helpful. I'm trying to stay under my time time limit here, um, but I hope that this talk is really helpful. Um, I'm really so inspired um that uh that you, that you've been here doing this work and i'm really inspired um at the initiative here to help faculty so thank you well thank you kathleen that was a lot to absorb and um hopefully uh, we could continue this discussion into the breakout rooms that we're about to go into now uh and hopefully kathleen you can join maybe and float around a little bit and uh answer any more questions but uh so right now debbie if you wouldn't mind uh we have uh, roughly eight to 10 minutes to talk about what you've just heard and how you might include diversity, equity, and inclusivity into your courses. So please click join on one of these. If you go to their website, thank you, sweetheart. Uh, <clears throat> if you go to their website, you can also um, you know, learn a little bit near. Here's Nextera's website. <clears throat> I will have to move through this more quickly. Uh, we will pro uh, provide these to you later. Um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I'd like to move on to our curriculum, <clears throat> excuse me, and I need to move on <clears throat> to our curriculum uh, research guide. Uh, presentation, uh, Peggy and Gina, take it away, please. So, Peggy, I think you're going to go first. Hi, I just dropped into the chat um, the link to the research guide that mm -hmm. I created for lead buildings on campus. And so I just wanted to remind everybody that there are librarians who could work with you to help you find content to support some of the research and teachings that you want to share with your students. I designed the guide uh, working um, with the faculty in the art and history department. So it's just an example of something that you could do also. Um, and with that, Gina's gonna talk about the guide. 
Okay, so if you can click on the link, please, some whoever can click on that for me. Okay, so here is the um, sustainability curriculum guide that Peggy created and I assisted with some of the resources on it and it's got some really good information. Um, some of it includes resources here at San Jose State and some, and then what efforts in sustainability in the curriculum on campus and education and sustainability networks. And then one of, and then of course, sustainability in um, King Library. And then the last one here is one of the ones I worked on more. So if we could click on community resources, please. Okay. It's down at the bottom. Got it. And so here's some of the ones I picked. And the ones that probably would be more most useful would be a links to um, the Earth Day. Um, we don't have to open it necessarily. Um, and then environmental services with City of San Jose. They've got some really good resources that might be helpful in classes or your curriculum. And um, then also Moss Landing, which we mentioned earlier. And then Santa Cruz, um, uh, UC Santa Cruz has a lot with, does a lot with permaculture. And there's courses you can take through that and events as well. And then Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment also has some really great webinars. They even have some in-person, um, but I, I don't think they're doing any of them right now, but they do have in-person events as well. And, um, I, as, you know, I've never seen any that they actually charge for. So it's a really nice resource. <laughs> and then the University of California has Master Gardener program. And that's, again, has some really good resources. And then Veggie Lucian is a, a local organization that promoting uh, organic food and uh, making um, fresh organic produce available to com in the community. And that's based in um, East San Jose. Um, but so the, some of the ones I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, Earth Day uh, in particular and Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, they have, again, a lot of webinars and events that you can attend that are free and they have really good resources. And then Stanford Woods Institute also has a newsletter you can subscribe to and it's free. And then they, they, um, they'll talk about some of the things going on at Stanford, but not just at Stanford. Um, they'll have links to research efforts going on elsewhere as well. So really good resources and, and they're useful to have them perhaps as links in your Canvas courses if you wanted, if there was a topic that would be of particular interest in your course that, and that might be useful. And then some of the other community resources I mentioned are just um, things, for example, Hidden Villa is a farm in Los Altos Hills and so for, for example, um, they have volunteers. So maybe some of your students might be interested in volunteering there. <laughs> and then um, Village Homes is kind of an interesting place because it's a community of homes where they put in a lot of in, um, environmental and sustainable features. And it's a, a, a development of homes that's in Davis, California. And it's located in like a standard regular suburban neighborhood. But when you go in, it's completely different looking. If you ever get the chance and to go up to Davis, it's a really interesting uh, place. And they were kind of ahead of the time because I think they did that in the 70s or early 80s where they developed that area. And so again, you know, as you can see, there's some really good resources that Peggy has developed. And Peggy is also the, um, the reference librarian for environmental studies. So she is a really good resource for any questions or any research you want to know about that. Okay, are you all done? Yeah, I'm finished. Okay. So um, let's see, that's, okay, let me, then I have to do this, okay. Okay, uh, back to um, screen share again. Uh-oh, my bad, I just killed it. Okay, um, next on the list, um, and I will go try to find my uh, screen share stuff is uh, Bill Musgrave. Uh, Bill is a lecturer in the School of Global Innovation and Leadership uh, in the Lucas College and Graduate School of Business. And uh, Bill is here to talk to us about his experience inserting sustainability uh, into his curriculum.
Okay. Um, let me sort of find my PowerPoint here. Okay. Um, Bill, I can't seem to find it. Let's see. Uh, are we doing share? Yeah, I can. Uh, Debbie should be able to. Oh, here it is. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're there. Uh, well, first, first of all, when this initiative came out last spring, I, I was really uh, excited about it. I, I thought this is not only the time has come, but it was uh, a great initiative for San Jose State. The difficulty, of course, is how do we fit it into our curricula? out of and of our courses. And so um, it was mid semester or, or, or I guess more, more at the start of the spring semester when the, you know, this came out. And I had two classes that I was teaching uh, principles of management and organizational behavior. Uh, another course was the global dimensions of business 187. And so um, I began to think about, well, how can I put this in because it was not only the right thing to do, but the timing was great in terms of the challenges that we face as a, as a society. So I'll walk you through what we've done. Um, so the two courses uh, again, and um, the way I've basically integrated sustainability into these classes is uh, number one, both classes have a chapter on ethics. So ethics fits uh, sustainability fits beautifully into ethics. And so I not only lecture on sustainability in that uh, ethics uh, session, but also have one or two test questions on it. Uh, but the big part is the student research. And in 160, what I've typically done is I give students, uh, divided them into teams and uh, they have assignments throughout the semester. But the big one is a research project. And typically I'll have 20 some odd contemporary topics, you know, all the way from work-life balance to, to managing, how do you deal with conflict? And so when sustainability came along, I, I put that into the list. And uh, so what I do is I give, give out the list at the start of the semester and, uh, and student teams would, you know, pick number one, number two, number three. And then I would go through and try to spread the assignments so that, the class experienced the presentations from um, you know, other students. And so the last two semesters, spring and now fall, I've had um, uh, two teams, both semesters doing sustainability. So, um, you know, the, and that gives feedback in our presentations to the rest of the students. Um, I think my biggest uh, uh, inclusion of sustainability has been in the global dimensions of business. Uh, again, I lecture on ethics one, one session. I include sustainability in that um, and also an exam. But the big one is a student research topic. And the, the project is all about building an imaginary multinational enterprise. And so students have to imagine a company. They tell the, all the backstory, of what the company does and everything like that, how they will enter uh, another country and with two operations and you know operations at two different countries to become a multinational enterprise. So what I did was I jumped on this and said, every one of your imaginary companies has to embrace sustainability in some manner. And um, so, um, and in terms of uh, the um, United Nations uh, goals, I, I think we, most of the students' projects will touch uh, four of them. Number six, water and sanitation. Seven, energy. Thirteen, climate change. And fourteen is oceans. Okay. So let me show you a little bit more substance on what we what we do. Uh, so in one sixty, there's the description that uh, I use uh, that students can you know look it over and and get an idea of what uh, this project is all about, management of sustainability in business. Um, as I read it, <laughs> I'm, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm limited a little bit. I talk about global climate change, but I don't address all the other dimensions of sustainability, which, which I should. Um, um, the students use the Martin Luther King Library uh, quite a bit. That's a big resource to them. And um, at the end of the semester, they'll give a presentation to the rest of the class 
and uh, I've got two teams, uh, both semesters are embracing, are doing research on the management of sustainability in business. And this little graphic I put up here, you know, this is, uh, you know, the norm, the businesses that embrace sustainability, this is their model. People, planet, and profits. You know, you always have to make more money coming in than goes out. Uh, our a business is not sustainable, okay? My clicker, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so in uh, the m and &E project, multinational enterprise project, so every student team has to incorporate sustainability in some aspects. Uh, and <clears throat> the guidelines are, um, um, when a company embraces sustainability as a foundation of mission, there's a multitude of ways that can incorporate sustainability in its operations. And check out sustainability back in the textbook, page 157. So I give them some very precise instructions and check out what Starbucks is doing as an example. So there's two situations that companies, that the students face in the companies that they've invented, the imaginary companies. Uh, they can go overseas uh, or go to Mexico or Canada uh, uh, within North America uh, and enter a developed country or enter a developing country. So in their report, they have to address about 12 dimensions of, of their company. And a couple of them are just the, the backstory, their history in the United States. But then when they go into a foreign country, there's a whole bunch of things they've got to address. What's the culture of the company, country? What's the operating conditions? What does the competition look like? Uh, what kind of government do they have? And so when I added sustainability, uh, there's two circumstances and they've got to address uh, how sustainability marries up with the circumstances they face in the country. And there's two, um, two situations. One, entering a developed country, you know, like England or France, European country, uh, that uh, they're going to be invited in uh, because they check the blocks of sustainability. And that country is, is uh, serious and devoted and up on the step on sustainability. The other circumstance is entering a poor developing country that's got all kinds of sustainability problems. So they'll also be welcomed in there uh, because they can be a leader, they can set an example, they can help the company, country um, advance and deal with the issues they face in sustainability. So what I found is that this project is just really terrific. It, it's, I've been excited about it. Uh, I, got a, I got a grant to put this in, um, a curriculum enhancement grant a few years ago. And then when sustainability came along last spring, it really has elevated the, the excitement, the richness, the importance of this assignment in 187. So let's take a look. So how many students have experienced sustainability the last two semesters? Well, in 160, we've had 97, uh, 45 in the spring, 52 this fall, 187 global dimensions of business, um, I've got two classes there. One's a biggie. So uh, 74, 45, 32, and 110. So 261 students uh, have been taken through the best that I can do on, on uh, walking them through sustainability, okay, and experiencing it in their projects, okay? So about 358 students in all have been touched by uh, these changes in my two courses. Uh, in conclusion, uh, students take to sustainability like ducks to water. That's the big uh, optimism here. Um, we've, the younger generation, they get it and they embrace it immediately. And I just think as educators, the sky's the limit, the door's wide open for more and more um, enhancements of our curricula in sustainability. So. Thank you. That's a very quick run through, but uh, uh, I'm excited about what San Jose State is doing. I'm excited about uh, the initiatives and the leadership that's there. We just got to keep the, we just got to accelerate it. Okay. Bill, that's it. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Okay. And I'm going to uh, return to my screen here. Um, sorry for the, okay. So uh, next on the agenda, um, 
Ellen, if you want to introduce Sanjay with our third and final testimonial. Are, are you muted, Ellen? I can't hear. I, I, I'm, I'm unmuted, but is Sanjay here? I don't think he's joined us, so. Oh. Okay. I was just uh, double double checking, but I don't I don't see him, so. Just well, let's. Um, if I you think. want to look for him, we can move on to this next yeah, uh, segment. Yeah. All right, uh, Peggy, are you ready? Okay. So everyone, we're so delighted that you're here with us today, and to learn how we're embedding sustainability in our curriculum. So one of the things I'd like you to do to think about, regardless of whether or not you apply for a sustainability grant, is I'd like you to think about um, which of the UN sustainability development goals you might start thinking about including in your curriculum. So um, in the chat, I am dropping in the link to the UN sustainability goals. And so, uh, if you would bring that up on your screen, the next screen, we're going to ask you to participate with us on um, identifying which goals you might consider doing. So the next screen is an instruction of how to mark up the PDF. So what I'd like you to do at the top of, your, of this next screen is we want you to, um, you'll see something called your viewing bills or Debbie screen. If you could pull down the options link and then down below it, click on annotate. And then the next screen will be a PDF that you can annotate. And so when we, um, Debbie, if you could insert the PDF, then we'll get that started. So what we'd like you to do is we're not asking you to commit to a particular, you know, SDG yet, but if you could just mark the ones that you might be considering. Okay, Debbie, can you bring that up? Or uh, I could share my screen where I have that also. Okay, there we go. So, um, hang on, let me move this. So again, at the top of your screen, you should see something, you're watching Peggy's page. So if you pull down that more link, you'll see that link that says annotate. I can't show you here on this screen, but then you could click the annotate. And what that looks like is... It's my screen, but I don't see that on my screen. Okay, so why don't we do this instead? In the chat, if you would say, pick the numbers that you would consider including as part of your curriculum, that's another way that you could share that. So I think we could all agree we would probably all choose quality education, right? That's something that we are focused on now. And perhaps number 17, partnership for the goals, because we realize we can't accomplish these goals on our own. So besides number four and number 17, which of these um, sustainable development goals fit with your curriculum? Which ones you might want to explore as part of your curriculum? If you would go ahead and send that to the chat, that would be awesome. And we could take a look at that. So I did send you the link earlier to them so you could have that page up on your own if you want. Did I mess up, uh, Peggy? Because I, I've got a note to stop sharing and I did and now I don't see anything. It's fine, it's fine. I think right now we're just waiting for people to drop in the um, okay. SDGs that they would want. Okay, so Ellen says 12 to 13. Let's see. Jamshid said 10 and 8, Eric 5, 15, Sandra 1, 2, 12, 13. Igor says number 7, ensure affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern energy for all. And Navrati 
I hope I'm not killing everybody's name. Sorry, 3, 11, and 12. So again, this is just a fast exercise to get you to like look at them and think, well, what would be applicable for my curriculum? What could, you know, I engage students with? So I want to thank everybody for participating in this exercise. I'm sorry that our um, annotating tool didn't quite work out. I promise I did practice this ahead of time, but you know, <laughs> the best intentions sometimes they just don't work out. But at least you have the links now, you've had a chance to play around with them. And so this is a tool for you all to think about like how, what, and you know, you could go further and see what you want to include. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, uh, Peggy, for uh, hanging in there with this thing. Uh, sometimes uh, technology can be a blessing and sometimes uh, not so much. So, um, so uh, Ellen, one more shot. At, is uh, Sanjay around or shall we just go to conclusion? I know he was on the road and something must have come up, but no, he hasn't joined us. Okay, um, so the final uh, bit is... Um, the uh, where do we go from here? Uh, and so I'm going to walk you through the application. Um, so when you click on that, uh, you'll get this kind of a, a, a screen that basically acts for your personal information, uh, your course number, your course description, um, and the student current student learning outcomes. And then, uh, you know, most importantly is your answer here, a uh, description of how you will incorporate sustainability into your course. Uh, and uh, then just kind of some more general information about the kind of course it is. Uh, and then we get to your commitment. Um, you know, if you want to apply for a stipend, uh, then this is what you would be committing to, uh, basically including sustainability in the learning outcome of your course, uh, providing a copy of the syllabus, uh, either new or redesigned, uh, including materials and readings, and uh, and then attending some, uh, you know, and again, these kickoff meetings and, and project check-in meetings are basically to help you, but to attend these meetings uh, and then a final celebration at the end, uh, so to celebrate uh, what you've done. Anyway, that's uh, what you need to do uh, to uh, apply if you are interested, and hopefully you are. Um, we do have uh, funding available, as I said, uh, to provide you with a $500 stipend for incorporating sustainability into your course for next semester. So um, with that, I will leave it uh, open to any questions that you may have. I don't think uh, from a GE, no, it just, we just want to know, uh, you know, that doesn't really affect the, you know, the, the substance of the proposal or how it's judged. In fact, GE courses are great because they don't, uh, they don't go against somebody's major, right? Uh, and we know a lot of majors uh, in terms of units are impacted. So no, that's, that's fine. Let's say anything else that I can answer here. Any more questions? People want to raise their hands. I guess I, I would just encourage folks if they're um, interested in working on these issues with other faculty on campus. Um, we have some uh, human rights working group projects that um, that will help provide support um, to, to do this interdisciplinary work. Um, and I'm really excited about um, about this and, and making sure that we uh, do our do do good work, right, as we do the, our curricular um, enhancements. And so I think we have some great ideas about moving forward. And I would be happy to, um, to email anybody if they want to chat about um, ways to collaborate on these projects. And thank you to the Sustainability Office to get us started. Right. And well, thank you all for attending. And, you know, uh, when you go back and, uh, you know, you when it, hopefully you will go back and, and, and maybe take a, a, another look. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in the chat, uh, and I'm sorry that we couldn't uh, cover that all, but there's a lot of great links, a lot of great information. Uh, so um, we'll make sure that we can provide that information to you as well. But uh, I highly encourage you to go back and, and look through the chat information uh, that uh, people have so generously shared of, uh, of themselves. Anyway, uh, if there aren't any additional questions, then uh, we will call this a day. Uh, thank you again for attending, and I look forward, or we look forward to getting your applications, and um, we look forward to expanding our influence in terms of incorporating sustainability 
across the curriculum to all of our courses. Thank, Thank you all. all. Thank you. This was great. Take care. Bye-bye.